Hello and welcome to module three of five for clinical infectious diseases assessment and management designed for residents, students, or clinicians who want to prepare for clerkships or residency rotations in infectious diseases. My name is Jackson Stewart and I'm an infectious diseases clinical pharmacy specialist. In this module, we're going to focus on reviewing the most common bacterial infectious diseases with specific emphasis on the most common pathogens that are implicated, the common clinical presentations, and some management tips. These details in combination with the knowledge we've accumulated in modules one and two will help us apply a systematic approach to infectious diseases in modules four and five. Specifically, we'll create an overview of the most common bacterial infectious diseases from a head to toe approach and highlight specific diseases with a focused review. Next, we will discuss how we may begin differentiating between infections caused by viral or bacterial pathogens, which is an important skill when selecting treatment options. Lastly, we'll touch on some very important concepts in source control and host immunity, which are some of the most important factors predicting antibiotic treatment success or failure. Remember, an important difference between how ID trained clinicians and non-ID providers think about antibiotics is that we consider antibiotics by thinking about the specific pathogens we believe are involved, rather than pairing antibiotics just by disease. The relevance of discussing the disease is not only important for correct diagnosis, but also for becoming familiar with the most common pathogens implicated in each disease, which is the most important detail when considering antibiotic choice. Focus on this detail during our discussions of common bacterial infections. As with previous modules, the purpose of this session is to discuss the most common bacterial infections that 95 plus percent of inpatient providers will encounter and become involved in with regards to infectious diseases. In this way, this review should prepare you for most cases that you will see in real practice, but cannot replace the value of the internal medicine ID subspecialty service. We will not cover outpatient bacterial, viral, fungal, or other complex infections, and you should become comfortable asking your expertise service for advice when needed. Before getting into an overview of bacterial infections, I want to discuss the concept of duration of therapy that you'll see with regards to antibiotic treatment for a disease. You may have noticed that guideline endorsed durations of therapy for infections often conveniently land on perfect Gregorian calendar weeks like 7 to 14 days or land on neat clusters of days like 3, 5, and 10 days. Why is it never something like 6, 8, or 9 days? What this should be telling you is that these durations of therapies are not scientifically determined to be exactly necessary, but rather are placeholder durations that are traditionally used that have yet to been studied for shorter durations. In fact, every few years, a new study comes out which confirms something we already know for various diseases that we can probably use shorter durations than we have been. For example, seven days versus 14 days for uncomplicated gram-negative bacteremia. That said, when thinking about using existing durations of therapy, a good clinician thinks critically about those stated ranges and applies them specifically to individual patient cases. Think of this example of a prosthetic valve endocarditis prescribed a treatment course of six weeks of therapy. Ask yourself, could this patient do five weeks and six days? Does the one less day compromise the efficacy of the treatment? Providing treatment courses in durations less than recommended without good data should be seen as probably providing suboptimal treatment, but in cases of treatment toxicities or other barriers, we should think critically about the durations we prescribe for individual patients. An important part of the assessment for any infectious disease is the recognition of both common features of infection, i.e. constitutional features that are shared amongst several infections and localizing features of infection, which provide hints and evidence for specific infections. Being able to produce lists mentally while assessing infections not only builds the evidence we need for infectious diagnosis, but also provides us with monitoring parameters that we're going to use when we're monitoring our treatment plans. Common features of infection include constitutional symptoms like fever, chills, rigors, which refers to shaking, often visible and intense, a common feature of true bacteremia, malaise, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, as well as night sweats. Vital instability is a feature that may represent more of a sepsis picture, but remember that the sepsis definition requires organ dysfunction. After we assess for signs and symptoms, via blood work we can notice a leukocytosis, which could be neutrophil dominant if bacterial, as well as elevations in acute phase reactants such as C-reactive protein and ferritin. Remember, 
even fever alone is not evidence enough for definitive diagnosis of infection, but certainly a collection of these common features should be building the case that we should be looking for an infectious diagnosis. Localizing features are those which hint to a specific infection in particular, for example, warmth, erythema, and tenderness for a skin soft tissue infection or lower urinary tract symptoms like dysuria, frequency, and suprapubic heaviness for a cystitis. Whereas blood work is rarely revealing for a specific source of infection, diagnostic imaging findings can be indicative of infection in this way. In particular, rim-enhancing lesions for abscesses or fat stranding seen on CT scans of the kidney for pyelonephritis. No single feature is enough to confirm infection, and when there are discordant features, a good clinician should be able to justify their gestalt judgment on the probability of true infection. So now that we know some general features of infectious diseases presentations, let's practice generating a list of infectious diseases in a head-to-toe fashion, such that in a patient who presents with common features of infection, we could begin to create a thoughtful approach to further investigation. Starting with the head, brain and CNS infections are certainly possible, the most common being meningitis, an infection of the meninges, and encephalitis, inflammation of the brain parenchyma. Abscesses can also appear within the brain parenchyma, and pyogenic collections can appear within the meninges, for example, a subdural empyema, or outside of the meninges, an epidural abscess, which would not technically count as a true CNS infection. We'll cover these in a bit more detail. Lower down in the upper airway system, we can see various infections, commonly viral, including nasopharyngitis, rhinosinusitis, and acute otitis media, which are typically outpatient infectious diseases, well managed by family physicians, or are self-limiting. Rarely, complicated infections can arise here, for example, malignant otitis externa and bacterial mastoiditis. Further into the lower airway, the most common infections encountered in the inpatient setting is pneumonia, which comes in many forms. Much less commonly, tracheobronchitis can be infectious uncommonly via intubated patients, and lung abscesses or pleural empyema can complicate pneumonia cases. In the heart and bloodstream, bacteremia from many sources can occur and secondarily result in infective endocarditis, depending on the organism, an infection of the heart valves that is very common cause for infectious diseases consultation. In the GI tract and biliary tree, cholecystitis and cholangitis are probably the most common intra-abdominal infections, with self-limiting viral gastroenteritis being common in the outpatient setting. In the colon, diverticulitis is common as well as clostridioides difficile infection, which is a major cause of hospital-acquired infection. Peritonitis is a common infection with several varieties we will discuss as well. The urinary tract can be commonly affected in several places, the bladder, cystitis, the kidney, pyelonephritis, or the prostate, prostatitis. Sexually transmitted infections can be discovered in the inpatient setting, but are commonly non-acute and can be treated out of hospital. Lastly, on the skin, cellulitis is the most common infection, although through the skin, line-related bloodstream infections are commonplace in the hospital. The bones and joints are also a common site of infection, including septic arthritis in the joint and osteomyelitis of the bone. Practice identifying all these infections in a head-to-toe fashion to assist when you're looking for localizing sources of infections when suspected. As discussed in Module 1, several organisms are well known to cause nosocomial infection, that is, hospital-acquired infection. However, when nosocomial infection is suspected, a few types of infections are much more common than others. For example, let's take a case of a 76-year-old male who is admitted for heart failure, post-admit day 13. The patient is recovering well and is almost ready to be discharged, but develops a temperature of 38.5 and a small leukocytosis of 14.1 up from 8.1. When approaching this case, instead of looking head to toe for every single possible known infection like otitis media, which is incredibly unlikely the cause of this, which specific infections should we be focusing on? In the hospital setting, four infections are much more common than others. These are one, line-related or catheter-related bloodstream infections related to intravenous access, two, C. difficile infection, recognizable by new and profuse watery diarrhea, even if not on antibiotics. Three, catheter-related urinary tract infection, if a Foley catheter is in place. And least commonly, number four, hospital-acquired pneumonia. By knowing these common nosocomial infections, our assessment process can be more focused and directed for inpatients with new fever before looking for less common sources.
First, let's discuss some common CNS infections. Remember that the CNS is normally sterile. Bacterial appearing in this site is atypical and requires investigation. In general, bacteria or viruses have penetrated through the blood-brain barrier and infected either the meninges, the connective tissue protective covering of the brain, or the brain itself, for example, in encephalitis. These organisms are then found in the cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF, the fluid cushioning the brain and ventricles. Inflammation of these sites is what produces symptoms in these cases. The question is, how did it get there? Young children in particular who have an immature blood-brain barrier are among the most frequently implicated, with organisms originating from the sinuses via contiguous spread to the CNS. Adults and others who are immunocompromised could develop a CNS infection, particularly when infected with a virulent strain of pathogens such as Streptococcus pneumoniae or Neisseria meningitidis. Those with surgical portals into the CNS, so for example post-neurosurgery, can develop a brain infection called ventriculitis involving the brain tissue surrounding the inner ventricles. The two main CNS infections that all providers should know are meningitis and encephalitis. In particular, it is useful to be able to tell them apart since the treatment is very different and involves targeting bacteria versus viruses in many cases. We should remember the cardinal triad of meningitis symptoms, headache, fever, and stiff neck or nuchal rigidity on exam, which is enough clinical evidence for the working diagnosis of meningitis. Encephalitis, on the other hand, could present with fever and headache, but typically involves seizure, altered level of consciousness, or some other focal deficit. These are distinct enough that one can begin to tell these apart based on early histories taken in the hospital. Further, typical pathogens in meningitis include those which spread from the local sinuses and upper airway. Remember those from our microbiota we memorized in Module 1, namely Streptococcus pneumoniae, miscellaneous gram-negatives like Haemophilus and Neisseria species. Whereas viruses are the primary cause of encephalitis, including herpes viruses, enterorhinoviruses, West Nile virus, and others, depending where it was acquired. So already, we're thinking that antibiotics are probably justified or definitely justified for meningitis, but probably not for encephalitis. Notice as well that the three most common bacteria that cause meningitis are the ones that we vaccinate all children for. Diagnostically, there are important differences via CSF analysis, which can be obtained via lumbar puncture, that you need to be able to evaluate. Here is how we can interpret a CSF analysis simply. First, with a suspicion of a CNS infection, a lumbar puncture may be obtained if possible, although there are some contraindications. In the CSF analysis, we would expect an abundance of inflammatory cells if a real infection was present, so an elevated total nucleated cell count is indicative of an infection of any variety. Even if antibiotics were given prior and cultures were sterilized, I would still expect an elevated total nucleated cell count. Next, if there was an elevated TNC, the next question is what type of white blood cell was elevated? This is our next hint to the etiologic pathogen. If the TNC is neutrophil dominant, we expect either a bacteria or a fungal pathogen, although fungi are very rare. If lymphocyte dominant, this is typically indicative of either an early viral infection, but possibly also of a late bacterial or other type of infection. Lastly, and least importantly, a low glucose and high protein might be another clue for a bacterial infection, whereas normal glucose and high protein could be indicative of viral or other infections. Remember, we put all these details together for an appropriate summary assessment and should not anchor on one assessment point alone. Briefly, other common infections involving the peri-CNS space include the epidural abscess, which is a non-CNS infection outside the meninges, commonly caused by local spread of infection from the vertebrae or hematogenous spread via the bloodstream. And a subdural empyema is an abscess-like collection beneath the first layer of the meninges that can be due to injury or neurosurgery. In both cases, complete treatment would necessitate some form of drainage to remove the infected material, but long durations of antibiotics, for example six weeks, are typically provided. Whereas for meningitis, since there is often no discrete collection of abscess or pus, antibiotics alone are often enough for cure, and treatment can be shorter, often 7 to 14 days, depending on the specific organism being treated. Interestingly, meningitis is one of the few infections where duration of therapy is guided by pathogen identity. An absolutely fundamental infection to know very well for all providers is pneumonia, which of course is a lung parenchymal infection that can be caused by bacteria, viruses, and fungi. 
we're learning to think like an ID clinician. Today we will learn how to be much more specific about pneumonia and what is causing it, which can be done to better select antimicrobial treatment for your patients. Importantly, although pneumonia can be simple and cause infection of the alveoli and interstitial space, untreated and with certain virulent pathogens, pneumonia can evolve into causing bacteremia and sepsis, local spread into pleural space infection and empyema, or the generation of discrete lung abscess, all of which change treatment and strategy duration. Pneumonia is ubiquitous worldwide, and all patient demographics are susceptible in some ways, although some are more likely in particular those patients with pre-existing structural or chronic lung diseases like COPD, bronchiectosistent, and cystic fibrosis, or the very young and older adult patient population. Before, I told you that pneumonia can be caused by viruses, bacteria, and fungi. Bacterial pneumonia can also mean a typical bacteria pneumonia, remembering our respiratory atypical organisms. You should be thinking, therefore, how can I tell the difference? Obviously, this is the most important part of creating a treatment regimen that will actually be effective for my patient. In real life practice, the distinction between these subtypes is not often made by non-ID trained clinicians. Here we will discuss how to tell the difference so that you can choose the best treatment. Keep in mind that when a patient first presents, their symptomatology and history may be vague and unclear, but after 24 to 48 hours, all of these details are typically available, so you can revisit and specify your pneumonia diagnosis. First, let's distinguish true pneumonia from pneumonitis, which is a chemical inflammation of the lungs that is not related to infection. In patients who aspirate, that is, inhale oral contents involuntarily that irritates the lungs, the grand majority simply present with shortness of breath, a rapid desaturation in oxygen, and possible cough from the bronchospasm. However, we can distinguish this from aspiration pneumonia or other pneumonias by the absence of fever, chest x-ray findings, and quick resolution. Typically, patients will recover from this pneumonitis within 24 to 48 hours, whereas those with true pneumonia will not. Next, let's talk about acuity of presentation. Importantly, patients with different organisms at play present in different stages of acuity. Typical pneumonia caused by streptococcus pneumoniae, hospital-acquired gram-negatives, or pathogenic viruses like influenza or COVID-19 will often present with an acute worsening. So for example, clinical onset with worsening in the vast few days. This should be distinguished from a subacute onset with illness for about one to two weeks prior to eventual presentation, which is typical for atypical bacteria like mycoplasma pneumoniae or other viruses. This history detail can help us greatly when deciding the likelihood of a true bacterial pneumonia versus a viral or atypical pneumonia. Regarding severity of illness, most patients with viral pneumonia do not present to the hospital, although certain viruses, for example, influenza and COVID, can be causes of presentation, whereas bacterial pneumonia typically is severe enough to cause presentation in most susceptible patients. Thirdly, let's talk about epidemiological factors, since these alone can clue us into the etiology. Patients with typical bacterial pneumonia either are infected suddenly without sick contacts or can present as a secondary infection, i.e. double sickening, where previously recovering from a viral pneumonia or infection, they then suddenly became much worse. In cases of viral pneumonia, classically, patients may be aware of sick contacts, i.e. they knew that they had contact with a person who was known to be sick. The important distinction here can often tell us the difference alone. Patients who develop a hospital-acquired pneumonia by definition have symptom onset after 48 hours of being an inpatient, earlier than this would be considered community-acquired. Lastly, aspiration pneumonia patients are often known to have some history of difficulty swallowing or some nervous system dysfunction, which compromises their ability to protect their airway from aspirating oral contents. Lastly, after assessing the above, our last useful tool is the chest x-ray or imaging findings. Findings are different depending on the etiologic pathogen, specifically with a low bar or single unilateral infiltrate being typical for bacterial pneumonia like a streptococcal or hospital acquired pneumonia, whereas a bilateral patchy interstitial pattern is common for viral or atypical bacterial pathogens. This difference is reliable in context, for example, of COVID-19. Aspiration pneumonia may present with chest x-ray findings depending on how the contents were aspirated and the patient's positioning, but should reveal some infiltrate indicative of contents aspirated. Like all assessments, no one piece of this assessment should be relied on to achieve the diagnosis, but a collection of all these pieces together. This takes practice, so let's try a case together. 
Our example is a 31-year-old female presenting to the ED with a seven-day history of fevers, chills, myalgias, and headache. Over the last five days, she's developed a cough, shortness of breath, and chest tightness. Her white count is 10.3, and she reports that her daughter has the same symptoms but are less severe. On physical, she has fine crackles in both upper lobes, and a chest x-ray shown on her right demonstrates some patchy airspace opacities bilaterally, perhaps worse on the left than on the right. Your supervising attending asks you, what dose of ceftriaxone and azithromycin should I use? So what would your answer be? Pause the video if needed to consider what is really going on and what treatment is justified. The ID approach, of course, is we can be more specific about what is going on here. The case continued, you advocate for microbiologic testing to confirm what we think is going on, which is a viral pneumonia. We order an NP swab, a nasal pharyngeal swab, for a respiratory pathogen panel and COVID-19 testing and advocate to hold off antibiotics at this time. Testing returns within a few hours as nucleic acid testing positive for influenza A virus. As a key learning point for pneumonia, not all pneumonia should be treated the same. If you read Bugs and Drugs or really any other reference, these sources advocate for a one-size-fits-all approach to medicine, giving all patients with technically community-acquired pneumonia ceftriaxone plus azithromycin. But we know that all patients don't simultaneously have both typical and atypical pathogens. Clue into details into the patient's history, physical, and chest imaging to be able to tell the difference, and we will be able to actually provide the best treatment for our patients. For reference, this is a lobar pneumonia on the right side here. Ask yourself, does a patient with this lobar pneumonia need both ceftriaxone and azithromycin, or just ceftriaxone, or even just ampicillin, if this is most likely streptococcal? So you should be thinking critically for yourself. Even if you're new to infectious diseases, you've almost certainly heard of the term sepsis and maybe heard the outdated and irrelevant term septicemia used in movies. However, it's important that we straighten out exactly what these words mean. Bacteremia, literally bacteria in the blood, refers to the presence of bacteria in the blood, which can be asymptomatic and possibly even irrelevant, for example, if it was a contaminated sample. Whereas sepsis refers to an exaggerated and inappropriate immune response to infection, which by definition results in organ dysfunction. There have been a variety of changes to the definition of sepsis over the years, with the term septicemia being retired and no longer used in modern practice. Sepsis used to be related to SIRS, or Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, which involved vital instability, but obviously this definition was too loose, and patients without any infection often met criteria for sepsis. The new Surviving Sepsis Campaign definition refines this to a source of infection plus immune response causing organ dysfunction. Bacteremia may be the cause of sepsis, but just like any other infection, although minor infections like cellulitis or streptote are very unlikely to cause sepsis. However, when we identify bacteremia, we should always be considering where did the bacteria come from? This will be critical for treatment because you can kill the bacteria with antibiotics, but if there's a persistent source of bacteremia, this will simply band-aid the problem until antibiotics are stopped. Sepsis, on the other hand, requires antibiotics to fix the infection component, but the immune response and life-threatening organ dysfunction component is often managed with a combination of fluid resuscitation and vasopressor administration. Infectious treatment will be targeted against the identified source. It is important to emphasize the importance of fixing the source of bacteremia, particularly when it is a trigger for sepsis. Luckily, now that we've memorized our need to know bacteria and our head to toe microbiota in module one, we can predict the source of the bacteremia based on the identity of the bacteria. Remember, bacteria will usually cause infection from a source relative to where they live normally as commensals. So let's try a few examples. A case of a patient with Virden's group streptococcus bacteremia coming, uh, causing endocarditis, where do you think the VGS came from? Or a Staphylococcus aureus bacteremia, what is a most likely source? If you found Clostridium septicum in the blood, where would you go looking for the index infection? And finally, for Stenotrophomonas, what places might you consider? For VGS, remember, it is a normal part of the oral and GI tract microbiota, so I'd look for bad dentition. For Staphylococcus, it's a normal skin commensal, so I'd look for a really bad skin infection or an infected IV line. All Clostridia are normal enteric anaerobic flora, so this bacteremia would be a bad sign for a problem in the large intestine. 
And lastly, stenotrophomonas is a nosocomial pathogen, so it could be causing an IV line infection, but we know that it commonly causes pneumonia in those patients with structural lung disease. So I'd also look for respiratory symptoms. Now let's discuss a very common infection seen in the inpatient setting that can be complicated and lead to a lot of patient morbidity. Infectious endocarditis involves the infection of the endocardium, by definition the innermost layer of the heart or vasculature, which most commonly involves the heart valves, since there is the most turbulence in these areas, and the most surface area for bacteria to become stuck and accumulate. If bacteria get into the blood and become stuck on these valves, they can grow into an organic biofilm known as a vegetation, which also accumulates cellular debris to become a mobile mass attached to the valve. If the vegetation is large enough, this can obviously compromise valve function opening and closing, which can lead to heart failure symptoms. Commonly, however, endocarditis is caught before this stage. Another problem with having a vegetation growing on the valve is the thrombotic and immunologic consequences. Pieces of this vegetation can break off and embolize through the bloodstream to distant sites of the body causing problems, for example, a pulmonary septic emboli in right-sided endocarditis, or a septic embolic stroke in left-sided disease. Also, our immune system may develop a reaction to the presence of this mass, which can create specific well-known features of endocarditis that are looked for in patients by the ID consult service. These are also much more common in the days before antibiotics, when patients would become bacteremic for long periods of time. But an important question is, why do some patients get endocarditis and others don't? i.e. if bacteria can get in our blood from time to time, why does this not always happen? First, patients with pre-existing valvular disease are much more likely to accumulate a vegetation, for example, those who either have known valvular disease or a prosthetic heart valve, or those who have a congenital heart defect that they don't know about yet, like a bicuspid aortic valve, and two, those who acquire a large burden of bacteremia or high inoculum of infection, for example, those who have intravenous drug use or line related infections who develop overwhelming bacteremia which can infect native or normal heart valves. These patients typically develop right-sided infective endocarditis since intravenous injection would lead to infection of the first valves encountered, the tricuspid or pulmonary valves. Importantly, there are some bacteria that are more likely to do this than others, and they come in the form of the cram-positive bacteria, Staphylococcus aureus, Streptococcus, particularly the oral Virudens group Streptococcus, and Enterococcus. Infection due to gram-negatives like Pseudomonas, for example, are extremely rare. Patients usually present to hospital because of nonspecific constitutional symptoms like we discussed, features of bacteremia like fevers, chills, night sweats, and rigors, possibly with an identified new heart murmur or evidence that suggests intravenous drug use. Uncommonly, those immunologic, embolic, or heart failure symptoms are present initially, but would certainly point towards endocarditis. For research purposes, the Duke's criteria was created to predict the likelihood of definite versus possible endocarditis, although in real life, patients almost always present as follows. So first, they come in constitutionally ill. Second, they're found to be bacteremic with an organism that we know to typically cause endocarditis like staphylococcus. And then third, an echocardiogram or heart ultrasound is done, which reveals a mobile mass on one of the heart valves. This combination of events is enough for the diagnosis of infectious endocarditis and warrants treatment. Importantly, however, the treatment is two-pronged. Antibiotics directed at the pathogen in the blood are necessary, but sometimes cardiac surgery may be required for source control and management of the problematic vegetation. Intravenous antibiotic treatment is typically favored, although there are some uncommon circumstances where PO treatment could be justified for some small portion of the course. Duration of treatment is typically four to six weeks, depending on the organism and patient. We will touch later on more complicated management of patients who have prosthetic heart valves at the time of diagnosis. Next, we will discuss intra-abdominal infections. Remember that the GI tract is lined with billions of bacteria and even fungi. These organisms are not causing problems in most patients and are, in fact, contributing to the normal health and well-being of most people. The question is, why then do people develop infections with intra-abdominal organisms? The answer is, of course, something has thrown off the normal homeostasis of bacterial flora in the GI tract. This is done through three primary mechanisms. 
obstruction. So first, something has obstructed the GI tract, causing loss of physiologic flow and the creation of a nidus of infection, where bacteria can then overgrow and cause problems. Translocation or perforation, where the normal GI barrier has been broken or penetrated, allowing GI organisms to access sterile sites like the blood or the peritoneum, causing infection. Or lastly, exogenous infections like food poisoning, new bacteria are introduced orally, or opportunistic infections like C. difficile diarrhea, where healthy bacteria are killed, leaving room for pathogenic bacteria to overgrow and cause problems. Mechanism is actually important to think about because in some examples like obstruction, antibiotic treatment alone is unlikely to solve the problem entirely. The two most common upper GI infections in the inpatient setting include the biliary tree infections, cholecystitis, which refers to a gallbladder infection, usually caused by a stone obstructing the cystic duct and infectious material being trapped in the gallbladder, and cholangitis or bile duct infection, where similarly a stone or some obstruction is preventing flow out of the biliary tree, causing infection of the whole ductal system. Cholecystitis, therefore, would be less severe in general and lead to right upper quadrant pain, fever, and tenderness, but no jaundice, since bile backs up, no bile backs up into the liver and is contained within the gallbladder. Cholangitis, on the other hand, would be considered more severe in general and would present as fever, right upper quadrant pain with jaundice, since the obstruction is distal, causing backup of bile into the liver and then through into the blood. Typically, these infections are caused by normal denizens of the biliary tree. Do you remember what they are? If you remember from module one, these are typically our enterobacterialis, like E. coli, Klebsiella, and Proteus. Less commonly, this could involve enterococcus or streptococcus. Another group of common intra-abdominal infections are the infections of the peritoneum, known as peritonitis. Remember, the peritoneum should be sterile and contains a visceral space which surrounds several intra-abdominal organs. How then does it become infected? There are three different types of peritonitis, all with different mechanisms of how they occur, also with different implicated primary pathogens, which makes distinction important when selecting treatment. First is primary peritonitis, also known as spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, which, per the name, refers to the peritoneum being the primary problem. In these patients, they have ascites to begin with, a fluid accumulation in the peritoneum, often due to liver disease, which becomes secondarily infected due to increased GI permeability and inflammation. Think of your chronic liver disease patient due to chronic alcoholism, who has a large volume of ascites and develops new abdominal pain and fever. These patients often have infection with a single pathogen, often E. coli or other GI enterobacterialis. Second is secondary peritonitis, where the peritoneum may be healthy and normal, but a perforation causes spillage of GI contents plus minus feces into the peritoneum, causing infection. These cases obviously therefore involve polymicrobial infection, like GI enterobacterialis, possibly enteric anaerobes and streptococcus, and are surgical emergencies. Antibiotics will be one part of treatment, but invariably source control is required to stop spillage of bacteria into this space. Lastly, patients who have peritoneal dialysis can develop a peritonitis, but this is often due to infection via the PD catheter, which tunnels through the skin into the peritoneum, and therefore most frequently involves skin pathogens like Staph aureus. Treatment may require exchange of the dialysate and can even involve injecting antibiotics directly into the PD dialysate. I hope these infections reinforce the key point that distinguishing the likely pathogen can be done via close attention to the precise disease process. Only then can we direct antibiotics against the right pathogen and effectively treat the patient. Importantly, the type of abdominal pain seen in patients with peritonitis is sometimes different than the abdominal pain seen with other problems. Classically, peritonitic abdominal pain involves diffuse abdominal pain, non-localized, including involuntary guarding, i.e. the patient involuntarily protects their abdomen from palpation, and rebound tenderness. These may assist in recognizing peritonitis clinically. Importantly, when the diagnosis of SBP or primary peritonitis is being considered, an important diagnostic criteria is the paracentesis fluid analysis or acidic fluid chemical analysis. Just like with our CSF analysis, what would you expect to be in the paracentesis fluid if this was truly infected? 
white blood cells. In particular, we expect to see greater than 250 polymorphs or 0.25 times 10 to the 9 per liter in a patient with true SBP. This might be shown as an overall white blood cell count with a neutrophil percentage, requiring you to do some simple math to find the neutrophil count. We'd also expect to see bacteria in this fluid, and bacteria obtained this route can be sent for culture and susceptibility testing. Importantly, draining bacteria through these taps is actually a part of the treatment as well, or source control, and can help patients feel better much faster. Urinary tract infections are very simple, where depending on the organ involved in the urinary tract, different infections occur which cause different symptoms. However, non-ID providers unfortunately inappropriately refer to these simply as UTI, which is not helpful in clinically distinguishing what is exactly going on and can lead to error in diagnosis, especially when there are multiple problems occurring. Importantly, bacteria, as we discuss, can be found in the urine normally. This is referred to as asymptomatic bacteriuria. We discussed in Module 1 how bacteria can contaminate or colonize the urine due to close proximity to the GI tract, our enterobacterialis or enterococcus. However, this may not be consequential and actually require no treatment. Unfortunately, asymptomatic bacteriuria is still treated inappropriately today, and more work is required to educate providers on the harms of treating this harmless problem. More importantly, in medicine, it is still erroneously taught that delirium is caused by UTI. Think about that for a minute. Is there a biologically plausible reason why urinary tract infection, but not other types of infection, could lead to delirium? Further, do you realistically suspect a cystitis, a bladder infection, to cause as much of a systemic problem as a pyelonephritis? If there are no other features of pyelonephritis, do you still suspect that delirium alone could point to this? Providers unfortunately blame patients sometimes for not being able to report their whole symptomatology, for example, those with dementia. However, it is our job to properly diagnose and treat our patients and not our patient's job. We can do better in recognizing when a UTI, when it is present and ignoring a bacteria in the urine when it is not. As discussed, bacteria usually ascend the urinary tract through GI contamination, either causing bladder infection, a cystitis, a prostate infection, a prostatitis, or a kidney infection known as pyelonephritis. These infections do not commonly occur simultaneously. Importantly, patients who are chronically catheterized via a urethral Foley catheter can get infection that originates from chronic colonization of the catheter with GU tract access. Females are infected more than men who typically have a catheter if infected or some other anatomical abnormality allowing access despite a longer urethra. The only two types of patients who could warrant antibiotics for asymptomatic bacteria are pregnant women, where there is demonstrated evidence of obstetrical complications if that's not treated, and those who are about to undergo urologic surgery who might have an increased risk of infection due to manipulation regardless. Distinguishing the different UTIs apart can actually help us clinically, not just for treatment selection and duration, but also when the diagnosis is uncertain. For example, a patient with delirium is unlikely to have cystitis since it usually does not cause systemic features and mostly is local only. The worst UTI is the infection of the kidney or pyelonephritis, which causes all the shared features of a UTI or lower urinary tract symptoms such as dysuria or burning with urination, frequency, urgency, and possible incontinence. These should be routinely present in all urinary tract infections. Specifically, Pyelonephritis also presents with more systemic features due to connection to the bloodstream like a fever, a leukocytosis, and other constitutional features. Locally, costovertebral angle tenderness, which is the interface between the rib and the vertebrae, or CVA tenderness, which can be identified on percussion or on history if a patient reports flank pain, is much more indicative of a pyelonephritis and can be present even in patients who have trouble remembering their daily symptoms. Pyelonephritis is historically treated for longer than cystitis and can be treated with oral agents. If a patient is not improving with treatment after 48 to 72 hours, it may be reasonable to look for a renal abscess which can grow in a patient and require surgical drainage. The least severe UTI is the bladder infection cystitis, which presents with lower urinary tract symptoms but also suprapubic heaviness and tenderness. Commonly, some patients may have a reason for urinary retention as well. Patients with cystitis are classically systemically well and can be treated with very short treatment regimens, for example, a one-dose regimen of phospholmycin or three days of TMPS and MEX. 
do not blame delirium or fever on a cystitis without lower urinary tract symptoms or suprapubic findings. Prostatitis is encountered more frequently as chronic problems in outpatient males where they can present like a cystitis but also with lower back pain or perineal discomfort. Traditionally, due to theoretical concerns with prostate penetration of antibiotics for what it's worth, longer courses have been used historically up to 46 weeks in chronic diseases. Lastly, catheter-associated UTI can occur, which typically causes a local cystitis but can ascend to a pyelonephritis. This is much more likely in patients with a chronic indwelling catheter that is present for long periods of time without exchange, as it is more likely that it will be contaminated. Treatment is typically prescribed as for pyelonephritis, but exchange of the urinary catheter is the most important part of the treatment. The last group of infections we'll discuss are the skin and bone and joint infections. Skin infections are much more commonly encountered in the outpatient setting and typically come in varieties that depend on the depth of infection. Impetigo involves the outermost layer of the skin and appears as yellow crusting with erythema, commonly in pediatrics that is easily managed as an outpatient with antibiotics. Deeper infections, including cellulitis, which is distinguished from erysipelas by vague demarcation, whereas erysipelas has clearly demarcated borders, can be bad enough to warrant admission, particularly if they are rapidly progressive and spreading. Commonly, cellulitis is caused by some portal or wound, which allows penetration of skin bacteria, mostly Staphylococcus aureus and group A strep, to penetrate into deeper tissues. A distinction that ID clinicians make is between purulent and non-purulent skin infections, where purulent infections involving fluctuants, abscesses, and drainage are notably caused by Staphylococcus aureus dominantly, and non-purulent infections, i.e. none of the above, particularly also with lymphangitic streaking along the skin, are caused mostly by group A streptococcus or streptococcus pyogenes. This distinction helps with treatment selection. Depending on the severity, we either can also use oral antibiotics immediately or step down quickly to PO antibiotics to finish a course of as short as five days of antibiotics. Necrotizing fasciitis is a specific type of infection where depth may reach into the subcutaneous fat and musculature. The key distinction is with the presence of exotoxin-producing bacteria, predominantly group A strep, which causes tissue necrosis and destruction due to the toxin effect on local structures. This is a medical and surgical emergency, which requires source control aggressively with plastic surgery to debride infected tissues and remove dead musculature and fascia. Clindamycin, as previously stated, can be used in adjunct to beta-lactams for necrotizing fasciitis for its theoretical antitoxin effect. Although this is an unproven method, it is warranted due to the severity and morbidity associated. Clindamycin is usually stopped as soon as the patient is stable, which can be as short as 48 to 72 hours. Importantly, there are many skin mimics of cellulitis which have some features but not all features of true infection. Most commonly, venous stasis dermatitis, a problem with blood flow out of the legs, can lead to chronic skin changes that can appear as erythema, warmth, and even swelling. However, these findings are usually bilateral, where true cellulitis is almost never bilateral, and often do not involve true tenderness. A good clinical pearl is that swelling due to fluid accumulation can be tested by raising the extremity. We would expect that in venous stasis dermatitis, a fluid shift might occur, whereas in infection, there should be no fluid shift. Another common mimic is lymphedema, which leads to fluid trapping in an extremity. Patients with lymphedema should not have constitutional features of infection and certainly no tenderness, but sometimes fluid stiffness can lead to discomfort. Notably, lymphedema can cause chronic staining and change in the pigmentation of the skin in the extremity, which can complicate assessment. Remember to use the gestalt of all the expected features of these infections to determine if antibiotics are warranted or not. Lastly, bone and joint infections are very commonly encountered in the inpatient setting. Although the joints and bones are typically protected sites and sterile, they can be infected either through contiguous spread, i.e. through diabetic foot infection spreads from cellulitis into a deeper tissue, or from hematogenous spreading, commonly, for example, with Staphylococcus aureus bacteremia seeding the lumbar vertebral spine and joint space. Septic arthritis refers to the infection of the joint space, which is normally filled with a small amount of fluid, 
this fluid can become infected and grow bacteria. The key difference between the symptoms of a joint infection and a local skin infection is problems with joint movement, i.e. limitation in the range of motion and pain with joint manipulation. Diagnosis involves fluid analysis of the effusion, which should reveal plentiful white blood cells and bacteria, and treatment involves drainage, possibly debridement, and two to three weeks of antibiotics. The pathogen involved is often hinted at by the route of infection, for example, skin organisms if contiguous. Osteomyelitis is clinically distinguished, although can present similarly to cellulitis and septic arthritis by problems with weight bearing with that bone, since one of the bone's primary functions is structural weight bearing. For example, a child may initially have redness over their knee, but then develop pain when putting any weight on the leg at all, which is more suggestive of an osteomyelitis. Diagnosis involves diagnostic imaging. Various methods are available, but often MRI, to observe for evidence of bony destruction or abscess formation. And treatment involves four to six weeks of antibiotics, but also surgical debridement for source control in some cases. Before ending this section, I want to touch on the complexity of managing patients with prosthetic material implanted in their body. Remember I told you that organisms like coagulase negative staphylococcus can be contaminants, but can be real pathogens in patients with prosthetic material like joints, valves, and pacemakers in their body. These implants can become nidises of infection since the material, regardless of its type, can provide a surface that bacteria can stick to and grow on. Bacterial biofilm biology is complex, but suffice to say, bacteria of any species can create a discrete colony in a nidus where they create an inner core of protected bacteria that are not accessible from the outside due to their outer bacterial colony coating. Bacteria will incorporate their own colonies into the structure, but also create an extracellular matrix type glycosaminoglycan material that creates a protective matrix. Bacteria within the core are dormant, and antibiotics like beta-lactams, which theoretically rely on active replication of bacteria to kill, are less effective. Bacteria can awaken from the dormant inner core and release into the bloodstream as planktonic forms, which can then cause later infection if the biofilm is not destroyed through surgery. For these reasons, infections involving prosthetic material should generally be managed by a specialist ID service for recommendations for antibiotics, but more importantly, for advocacy for source control, since antibiotics alone are often simply ineffective against substantial biofilms. Importantly, planktonic antibiotic susceptibility may not reflect the susceptibility of the bacteria that are hiding within that biofilm. Let's take a moment to review some of the knowledge we've touched on, which helps us distinguish bacterial from viral infections. Remember that bacterial infections are generally more severe, have more prominent constitutional symptoms, and are not dependent on the time of year. In addition, patients with bacterial infections often do not have sick contacts, but in some cases, it may be discovered that several patients became sick at the same time. For example, five people eating at the same restaurant all become sick at the same time. It's probably bacterial food poisoning. Bacterial infections also typically cause a leukocytosis with neutrophil dominance, which is the main leukocyte active against bacteria. Viral infections typically are less severe, but are probably seasonal, i.e. worse in winter with crowding and other mechanisms, but also have patient histories with sick contacts. So for example, they say that somebody else was sick first and after exposure to that person, our patient is now sick. Patients with viral infections can have a slight leukocytosis, but generally this is less impressive than in bacterial infections. So a good rule of thumb is less than 15 uh, versus greater than 15 as a rough oversimplification. Overall, these are rough rules, but the importance here is that we should be carefully considering the primary pathogen at play and important details in the history can help us create a better assessment of the most likely organism. We cannot treat for fungi, bacteria, viruses, and parasites simultaneously. Well, we could, but this wouldn't be vastly inappropriate. Instead, it is our job to tell the difference and provide the best treatment. Several times you have heard me discuss in this module the role of source control in the management of a large proportion of infectious diseases. Let's visit a case example to elucidate the point. This is a 54-year-old male with poorly controlled type 2 diabetes and A1C of 11.6% and local signs of purulence in the left dorsal foot worse than baseline. 
The patient has had recurrent foot infections four times this year alone, and an MRI demonstrates osteomyelitis of the metatarsals and medial malleolus. General surgery is consulted who recommend below the knee amputation for the management of this foot. A question for you to think about is, after the BKA is performed, what role do antibiotics have in the management of this patient? Pause the video to consider for yourself. Antibiotics are reasonable, of course, for osteomyelitis, but do antibiotics at this point add anything? Does the patient actually still have osteomyelitis after a BKA? In this case, the osteomyelitis would be gone. There is no more infection. Antibiotics would provide zero additional benefit in this case, unless the patient, of course, was bacteremic and systemically unwell concerning from infection beyond the margins of the surgery. This highlights the most important factors for infectious disease treatment success, source control, burden of infection, and host immunity. First is source control. What we mean by source control is the surgical or interventional removal of an ongoing nidus of infection. So for example, an abscess, a biofilm, a necrotic lesion, an intravenous catheter, or some collection of material that remains in the body that is causing ongoing infection. With antibiotic therapy, Infections can be controlled in these cases, but not cured. Antibiotics might shrink a nidus, so for example, an abscess, but the only way to prevent it from regrowing when you let go of the antibiotics or recolonizing is with removal of the source. A key to antibiotic therapy, therefore, is recognizing when a scenario requires source control for cure or can we be managed by antibiotics alone. If we fail to recognize the need for source control, we will fail antibiotics, which can lead to unnecessary escalation of treatment or increase in dosage. Let's try some cases to emphasize the point and tell me if you think that there could be source control required and how would we get that source control. A case of community acquired pneumonia, which is complicated by a right lower lobe in pyema. Does this require source control? A 66-year-old male on dialysis with a central line who develops Staph aureus bacteremia. How would you get source control in this case if it's needed? A 52-year-old female with lower limb cellulitis related to a wound. Are there any strategies for source control? And lastly, a 12-year-old with osteomyelitis of the left tibia plus minus septic arthritis. Can antibiotics manage that alone? For the first case, an empyema is something that requires source control via drainage. Antibiotics alone are likely to fail. In the second case, a patient with Staph aureus bacteremia is likely to have it from the central line contamination. We need to remove that line in order for treatment to succeed. In the third case, source control may not actually be necessary and antibiotics alone might be enough to cure it, but wound care is likely to assist in speeding the recovery. And then lastly, in that case, osteomyelitis and septic arthritis frequently require drainage if there's an effusion present and debridement if there is necrotic or dead bone and tissue for treatment success. Always consider if source control is needed or you may miss critical reasons why antibiotics are failing. Lastly, host immunity and infectious diseases in immunocompromised hosts are an expertise topic of transplant infectious diseases subspecialty service and are beyond the scope of these modules. However, it's important to distinguish patients who are slightly immunocompromised, who have a slightly increased risk of normal infections like patients with diabetes or renal disease, versus patients who are truly immunocompromised like patients post-transplant, cancer patients or HIV positive patients who have increased risk of infection, but can also develop abnormal infections with organisms that don't normally cause disease or do so asymptomatically in most patients. Profound neutropenia, and prolonged neutropenia, i.e. an absolute neutrophil count of less than 0.5 for greater than 14 days, places patients at risk of strange and abnormal infections. These cases truly warrant specialist infectious diseases consultation. However, for all providers, it is important to recognize that one, patients can fail appropriate antibiotics for infections because of profound immunodeficiency. And two, when a patient is suspected of being immunodeficient, don't stop there. Ask yourself, why are they immunodeficient? And specifically, what is wrong with their immune system? I.e., do they have a lymphocyte deficiency or a neutrophil deficiency or something else? Depending on the reason, we see specific infections being caused in these special populations.
With that, we have finished the three core fundamental modules for infectious diseases assessment and management, covering many details regarding common bacterial infectious diseases that most providers will be involved in in clinical practice. Please re-review this material as many times as needed to reinforce these core principles in infectious diseases. We will take all of this knowledge to module four, where we will apply the knowledge in a systematic approach you can use for any infectious diseases case you encounter. References are provided for support of content and additional reading if interested. Thank you for watching.